Early this year, our New York-based cor senior correspondent, Chantal Fernandez, was introduced to a young man trying to break into the fashion business. On the surface, it's a story we've all heard before. But what makes this young designer different is that he's also an emergency trauma nurse who's been tending to COVID-19 patients while simultaneously trying to keep his fashion business afloat. After reading about him, I was curious to meet him, and I thought you would all enjoy meeting him too. So now I'm pleased to welcome Oluwole Olosunde, AKA Instagram's Guacawole, who joins us now from New York City to share his inspiring story and also some thoughts on how to breathe new life into the fashion industry. Welcome, Wole. Hi, Imran, thank you for having me. Over to you. Okay, so um, as Imran said, my name is Olu Wole on the Sunday. I'm an emergency room trash, um, trauma nurse and also fashion design designer. Um, I always feel like my life kind of like seesaws between these two worlds that kind of molded into what you see today. Um, I work night shifts, so my life is often flipped in comparison to the normal person. Um, working in the emergency department, things never really stop. It's always a continuous cycle. Uh, there's always nurses that need to be ready. There's always doctors that need to be ready for whatever that is that's going to come in. And I love the ER because just like fashion, it's full of surprises. You know, you never know what's going to come into the door and you never know what type of curveball you're going to be throwing. Um, and you just have to be ready to adapt. Uh, my love for science and the interest in the human body is what pulled me to healthcare. But New York City that raised me is what has always tied me to my love for fashion. Uh, New York City kind of holds style to a high esteem. And as a black man, I feel like my style is like my first line of communication to the world that often pairs my appearance to a stereotype. Um, stereotypes, you know, they place a stereotype on you that attempts you to place you in a box and delegates what you can know or what you can possibly do. Um, but being a nurse and a designer, they're two wildly different careers to the naked eye. But in my opinion, I find there to be so many similarities. Uh, the attention to detail, you know, understanding anatomy and the shape of the human body, how the body moves in relation to how the piece will move, uh, understanding the skin and the integumentary system and how the clothing will feel on the body and feel, and feel against the skin. Um, but also understanding emotion and how it might make the person feel as they wear that garment. Uh, both industries have been like really shaken by what's going on nowadays with the pandemic and everything. And it makes me really think like, how will we move forward? Because this moment right now is the opportunity to advance. Going in nursing school, going to nursing school, I always wanted to be a labor and delivery nurse. I always thought of childbirth as, you know, this sacred, beautiful moment. It's like the next step. Um, in people's relationships and you're kind of being a part of this really formative moment in people's lives. Um, it feels like you're, you yourself is single-handedly, you know, playing a part to manifest a new life. And in nursing school, I worked six months on a labor and delivery unit um, as a specialty rotation. And one day I remember there was this refugee woman who did not speak much English and she came in ready to deliver, fully dilated, very restless, just couldn't stay still. You know, we wheel her into the triage room and it, there's no point of a triage because she's ready to deliver. So we, we go directly to a birthing suite. Um, that day made me think so much about time because she was so ready to deliver that we couldn't even put an IV in. It was me and another nurse in the room and no other doctors because doctors are on call and on a labor unit. Sometimes as there's idle time, the doctors are not on the unit. So it was me and another nurse in the room and we delivered the baby ourselves. I was attempting to put a monitor on, on mom and I continuously kept moving downward and downward trying to find the spot of the baby's heartbeat and I couldn't find it. And as the baby descends, it gets lower and lower. So I moved the sheet to kind of put the transducer lower on her abdomen and I see the baby's head literally just sliding out. And, you know, you think we have so much time and we have, you know, control over the time we have, but ideally we don't. When things are supposed to happen, they just happen. And I feel like right now is a formative time in all of our lives that we have to take advantage of this. Um, according to the National Institute of Health, 
black women are actually four, uh, three to four times more likely to experience pregnancy-related death than white women. African-American babies actually have two times the risk of infant mortal mortality compared to whites, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And it feels abnormal to even say that out loud. Like, it doesn't, to me, that just doesn't make sense. And they're proven facts. Like, why are we okay with these statistics? And if we're not, what are we going to do about it? As a registered nurse, I'm always seeing and treating a wide array of people, you know, hearing their stories and understanding their lifestyles and cultures, listening to the many different languages and paying attention to their names and the way that, spelled, that they're spelled. By respecting people and who they are, through that you can create a care process based off their own culture and social norms. These experiences have structured a mind that, you, that works really rapidly but compassionately, and that's how you have to work in the emergency department. I've learned a lot about people as a whole. You see people at their most vulnerable and it's stripped away a lot of prejudgments that people usually have when they meet someone new. I get eager to meet new people and understand their perspective and hear a new story. You know, it teaches you because no matter how smart you claim you are, someone knows something that you don't. And this is where we must collaborate. This is where we must embrace a new theme and a new idea and include those who conceived it because it won't translate correctly. Just like healthcare, fashion has its blind spots, spots that we must now shine the light and scare away all the discrepancies. It's our duty to address those discrepancies in our industry, and we must face the facts and accept our issues and formulate new initiatives and new programs to address them. Fashion is currently in a hyper-political state, and we must take advantage of that to truly revolutionize our industry. Some people ask, when did fashion get so political? as if the, fashion, the American punk era never existed, you know? It's like, sometimes you walk into a room um, of fashion executives or, you know, forward thinkers in fashion, and it's like, where are all the young people? You know, we're all young at heart, but the young people are who dictate what's going to be next. And in order for us to actually move forward, we have to embrace them. We have to give them opportunity. That brings me to a theme that must continue to dwell in our minds as we shape the future, diversity and inclusion. We have to diversify not only the runway, but your beauty teams to make those new models look beautiful. We must widen accessibility, not only at the face level, but diversifying those boardrooms. We have to include the people of the culture in order to be able to discuss it. I believe that someday we might have like maybe a fashion A&R because music has its own A&Rs and people who look for new talent and new people who, who are going to push that boundary forward. And I feel like fashion needs that in itself. We have to get rid of the idea that fashion school graduates are the only ones who can be eligible for fashion positions. I had graduated from nursing school and I taught myself a lot of what I know, but I also had help along the way. As a second of five children born from Nigerian immigrants, I grew up in Clay Hill, Brooklyn, and it never, amazes, it never ceases to amaze me how much my parents had put together from nothing. As a child and all through my teens, I never saw my mom not in school. I never saw her not studying. You know, waking up and getting water and she's just in a corner over her books and getting paid $4 or like $3, whatever she would give me a page to type her papers up because she didn't work a computer too well. Um, and just my dad always adjusting his schedule to make sure that she can, you know, accommodate her studies. Watching them both constantly work hard towards the advancement of themselves and our family amazed me every day. It taught me that nothing I want is impossible. But although inspired by their drive, my parents, like many immigrants, were not too fond of my early passion for fashion. Skipping two grades and graduating high school at 16, I had much time to evaluate where I would take myself for the future. But my parents, but to my parents, fashion was never really like a secure career. Um, and even as the cultivators of style, black people often don't see themselves in fashion positions because it's not realistic for us. You know, we don't see ourselves on that face value on that on the public level in those realms. You know, our voices may now be amplified to an extent, but historically we've been silenced. And I think of models like Naomi Campbell and Yasmin Guardi and Tyra Banks and Lou Wen, who 
you know, and the newer models like Alton Mason and all these huge faces who, who inspire and, and give people hope through their platform. I think of designers like Virgil Abloh, who's also first generation and born from Ghanaian parents, who doesn't have a formal fashion education, but has taken himself to the highest platforms of men's design. You know, to me, he majored in architecture and architecture is the epitome of design. You're designing a society in which people will live in. You're designing an experience that's going to be continual over years. Um, in 2017, he, he like pretty much revolutionized. To me, Virgil really take, took streetwear to an extent that I never thought it would be. He proved himself as a creative by revolutionizing streetwear and then entering the men's luxury world. Just like I've combined my two worlds of like healthcare and design, in my eyes, he combined the two worlds of luxury and streetwear, thus conceiving much of what fashion has become today. But in 2017, before I started Against Medical Advice, which is my brand, I actually met Virgil. He was premiering his glasses at Warburg Parker at their store. And at the time, I had just completed the first pair of sunglasses I made um, in collaboration with my friend Keith Taylor, who was a me mechanical engineering student at Drexel University. Um, I designed the glasses and Keith 3D printed them on his home printer. And I was so excited to show Virgil the design um, as I was walking past the store and I, I saw that he was premiering his glasses as well. Uh, we spoke for about five minutes about like augmented reality and 3D printing, which were two things that I, I, I thought would revolutionize the industry in terms of like marketing and, and sampling. And the glasses that I made were actually a 3D printed sample that I had. After the entire conversation, I asked for an internship and he asked me to DM the off-white Instagram page. And I thought back onto um, today they premiered the Aaron Christians, the internship. And that really connected with me because it made me think of that drive to get your foot in the door, you know, as a new creative and a new designer and that confidence that you have in your work sometimes. Um, and, you, you know, you just want it to be seen. You just want to let people know that I deserve this spot and I will do what it takes to get there, you know? And when I'm given that opportunity, I'll do everything that it takes to allow it to grow, you know? And I think of when I started as a nurse and I wanted to be work in emergency or labor and delivery. Those were the two sectors where I was like, okay, applying to jobs, this is where I want to work. And as a new nurse, you're typically not going to start in an emergency because you don't have any experience. Um, but my boss gave me that opportunity. She said that we like new nurses sometimes when they show immersive, like when they show immense talent, because we know that we can harness that for our own growth. We can raise that nurse into the nurse that we believe they need to be to the standard that, you know, the CDC or, or all the people who make our guidelines you can teach them all those things and allow them to incorporate that into their practice. And we as fashion can learn a lot. We as fashion, as a fashion industry can learn a lot from that, honestly. Embracing new designers and teaching them the ropes, introducing them to our big fashion houses and allowing them to grow under us. You know, and there's another saying where they say nurses eat their young. And instead of like facilitating the growth of new nurses who are coming to the industry, they kind of, push them away and shun them and, and don't and don't welcome them and don't share their resources. And this isolates the, the new nurse in the workplace. But to whose benefit? It's not to the benefit of that nurse or it's not to the benefit of the patient. And just as a, like a fashion industry, it's not to the benefit of that specific individual or society as a whole. By including promising new talent, it gives us the opportunity to raise that person and mold them into the, the designer or employee or whatever the position is that you want to be, want them to be. I just feel like as we move forward, we must continuously think of how we can include the new and the up and coming. And during my two years in Buffalo in nursing school, I met a lady who owned an alteration store. I tried to convince her to construct the garment from scratch, but she stuck to her ways and said, I only do alterations and that's where I make most of my money. She refused to make me that piece, but she invited me to her space. She allowed me to use her machines. She taught me what she knew. She passed down all the information that she had 
to equip me to be able to make my own garments. By opening her space to me, I learned everything I know about garment construction today. I was able to make a lot of my own clothes in her space, and I brought all of those, all of those samples back to, with me to New York after nursing school. We as an industry can learn a lot from this woman. Her name was Ann Rods. She owned a very small store on Bailey Avenue in Buffalo, south of Buffalo. And I would ride my bike there on a daily basis from my studies or from clinical. Um, I think back to nursing school a lot because that balance that I had then has kind of shaped the balance that I need now. You know, going from clinical to the library to her studio, back to my dorm to sleep and then do it all again the next day. And then now it's just turned into you know, you get off a 7 a.m. shift and I have to run home, pick up my orders, go to the post office, then go back home, you know, sneak in a nap. And like, it's just always, you know, trying to find a balance between everything that I do. Um, the pandemic, wow, 2020. I think about this a lot too, because the pandemic, 2020, I always say it's the best year of my life, not in, in terms of all of these happy things that are happening, because that's not the reality. It's more so I feel like I grew the most this year. And I feel like we as a society grew the most this year. You know, it, it was an eye-opening time. Everyone's kind of more aware of what's important because that's all that's left, you know. At work, after the pandemic started, everything changed. Nothing was what it used to be. The ER didn't look the same. It didn't operate the same. We had patients everywhere. It was so hard to even walk around. It impacted me in a way that I honestly will never forget. I think back to like the AIDS epidemic and, and how established that was in, his, in history and you know what this is gonna mean for people today. So concluding, I just wanna leave you with three things and ask you a question. How can we breathe a new life into fashion? How can we be more inclusive? How can we be more diverse? You know, there's so many things happening in this world and people are scared, people are dying, people are tired, they're restless, they want something new. You know, I think of this moment at work during the pandemic and, you know, we have oxygen tanks and that's kind of our, our main source of like, that's our, this being a respiratory dis disease, everyone uses oxygen. Like everyone comes in and they need oxygen. Even if we don't give you, if your oxygen levels are low and we don't give you any medications, oxygen is something we put you on to see how you respond to it. And, you know, we used a lot of it during this time. And there was one day where we kind of ran out of all the tanks that we had nearing the end of our ship. And, you know, you have 10 patients and, and six of them are on oxygen and you're kind of figuring out who's the most sick, who deserves the oxygen you know, the most. And it's such a weird feeling even having that power. You're deciding who to breathe, who am I to, you know, make that decision. Um, I feel like this pandemic was such a trying time. And I want to give a shout out to all the healthcare professionals and everyone who's, um, you know, made the sacrifices that they made through this entire time. I ended up getting COVID. It wasn't easy. It was and I'm a pretty healthy person. I don't get sick too much. And, you know, that scared me because me who's healthy and doesn't get sick, I got the disease and, you know, I'm, I'm working to, to make people better and to, you know, help them and, and get them out of that place. And I just kept thinking like, how did I get here? I'm, I'm working for good. It doesn't make sense, you know, but um, I'm, I'm just thankful that I recovered. Um, I'm thankful for my health. And I feel like as, a society, fashion, healthcare, whatever industry you might work in, this is an important time to remain informed, to remain healthy, um, spread information to your families and friends. We have to take care of ourselves and we have to take care of our world. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very thankful to be here. Um, and I want to give it off to you, Imran. Thank you so much for being on this platform. Um, thank you so much, Wole. Um, that was that was amazing to hear your perspective. There's all these comments coming through. You have such a unique perspective on this year and so relevant for our industry. So I'm grateful for your time today. Thank you so much.